This year, economic reform is center stage. And the headliner is an overarching policy called supply-side structural reform. What is supply-side structural reform? Why now? What are its components? What deep-rooted problems does it address? Why did those problems occur in the first place? Practically speaking, what has been accomplished and what challenges lie ahead? And who are those mysterious interest groups who oppose these reforms? Watch supply-side structural reform to keep closer to China. A shower of molten steel, but the industry is facing a time of trouble. Overcapacity is the massive problem and the government is determined to cut it. Even as the economy is steered toward consumption, basic industries must be made healthy. Many believe the short-term pain will generate long-term gain. They include Fang Leping, who has been working in the factory for over 30 years. The economic slowdown has pushed the company to restructure its production and upgrade technology to improve quality. Products must meet market demand or else they can't be sold. Some furnaces have already been shut down. Fang's company is seeking to reduce costs and boost efficiency. Across China, many companies are shutting down or transforming to other industries. Cutting overcapacity is a national reform priority, as excess capacity impedes overall economic performance. This year, we'll further reduce steel production capacity by around 50 million tons and shut down at least 150 million tons of coal production facilities. At the same time, we will suspend or postpone construction or eliminate no less than 50 million kilowatts of coal-fired power generation capacity. This is in order to guard against and diffuse the risks of overcapacity in coal-fired power, improve the efficiency of the sector, and make room for clean energy to develop. China should also focus on bringing down the leverage of enterprises. To understand supply-side structural reform, I speak with three thought leaders. Zheng Xin Li is vice president of the China Center for International Economic Exchanges. He is a former deputy director of the Policy Research Office of the CPC Central Committee. Wang Xiaolu is deputy director and senior fellow of the National Economic Research Institute under China Reform Foundation. And Lu Feng is professor at National School of Development at Peking University where he is director of China Macroeconomics Research Center. So let's go into the specific categories that make up, that compose supply-side structural reform. What, what are the major components that you would look for to implement this policy? Yeah, of course, it's defined clearly, you know, and uh, there's uh, five crucial areas. I think we can approach this very important issue, you know, and uh, components of the policy or substance of the policy, you know, in different approaches or different perspectives. In direct sense, uh, of course, the policy makers in this country clearly defined five important areas or major five? areas. So one of the number one is the, how can I say, resolving overcapacity, especially in the steel and the coal areas. Number two, resolving inventories, you know, especially in the housing sector accumulated in the past, you know. Number three is sort of the deleverage, okay, deleverage, reducing the overall yeah, yeah. Yeah, leverage level, you know, in the financial sector or in corporate sector, even the local government sector, you know. Number four, you know, it is the reduction of the costs, you know, for the firms. Number five is so-called improving the weak links, you know, or bottlenecks, okay, mm -hmm. short walls. Okay, so these five areas. I think that uh, addressed crucial difficulties and challenges of the current economic circumstances. So, generally speaking, in my in my understanding, you know, in line with the five major areas, but actually there's a two major focuses. You know, the one focus, of course, it's sort of the policy position. You know, in dealing with the overhang and overcapacity or downward sloping and cyclical changes. It's not macroeconomic policy per se, but the position define, you know, the basic approach of the macroeconomic policy. So in other words, 
we don't want to stimulate too much. You know, we want to maintain reasonable economic growth, you know, to make adjustments as smooth as possible. But we don't want to put too much stimulus package to avoid adjustment. I think that kind of policy uh, stands actually embedded in the structural reform. It's not macroeconomic policy per se, but position defined that kind of policy. Number two, most importantly, crucially importantly, it addresses, I think, is the institutional transformation. You know, okay, institutional transition, that is the most crucial issues in China. The long-term benefit uh, that goes beyond the, the short term, whether it's a stimulus or, or dealing with the short term results, because by changing the institutional approach to it, then you build into the system a regularity of uh, self-correcting as opposed to having government intervene each time with a different policy. Exactly, you're correct, but also have a long-term and uh, influence, you know, because you change the institutional arrangements, you change the mechanism by which a lot of the difficulties and uh, realistic actual issues will be dealt with. So what would you say are the specific uh, prescriptions of supply-side economic reform as it's taking place in China right now? What are the big categories that collectively together compose supply-side structural reforms? The government sets both goals for short-term economic development and goals for the structural reforms. However, it remains a problem of which to prioritize when conflicts arise. If we emphasize too much the importance of short-term growth rates, structural reforms may be delayed or their pace may be slowed down. What's more, in order to maintain the growth rate, certain stimulus policies may be needed. For example, monetary policies will be loose and government investment will remain at a high level. However, as these policies are adopted, they may lead to further imbalances of the structure and bring about more negative effects. They will do harm to the structural reforms. Therefore, in my view, as we evaluate different policy measures, we should prioritize structural reforms and prevent too much stress on the short-term growth. Personally, I don't regard the slowdown of the short-term growth rate as a big matter. Rather, I think greater risks come from a sluggish economy in the long run. If the economy continues its trend of a slump, the consequences might be serious. To address this problem, we need to improve economic efficiency by reasonable allocation of resources. Therefore, in my view, there's no big risk if we promote structural reforms. On the contrary, risks abound if we refuse reforms and do nothing. As I've tried to understand supply-side structural reform in terms of the whole economy, the one of the articles that you wrote in People's Daily was actually very helpful to understand how the uh, uh, Chinese leadership is thinking about it because you wrote about the economy in terms of uh, a, a dialectical approach to contradictions and uh, a, a, a kind of a tension between two areas. Uh, give me a little bit of a sense of, you talked about five areas that you have this tension, this dialectical tension of contradictions. Uh, how, how does that work? There are quite some tensions or conflicts in China's economic development. To promote supply-side structural reforms, we have to understand those dialectical relations among which I want to summarize the five most important ones. Firstly, we have to properly address the relationship between supply and demand. They make up a contrary pair. We cannot talk about supply without addressing demand and vice versa. However, some voices now advocate that supply can be boosted without expansion of demand, indicating the two can be treated independently of one another. Such views are really one-sided. As to promote supply-side structural reforms, moderate expansion of the demand is needed, especially demand of the public with sufficient purchasing power. Secondly, we have to properly address the relationship between our short-term and long-term goals. 
Back to the essence of supply-side structural reforms, it mainly serves to solve the issue of long-term development, to adjust the supply-side structure and upgrade the industry through technological innovation. These are all issues to be resolved in the medium and long term, not within the year. We cannot mix the concepts. For example, as we design the annual plan, we have to consider general demand, keep the demand-driven momentum through monetary policy and maintain balance in the market. As for the long term, we can promote restructuring through fiscal policies. In this way, we can balance short-term and long-term goals to maintain a steady development of the economy. Thirdly, we need to properly address the relationship between urban and rural development, which is now the biggest challenge in our national economy. The reason is because markets in the rural and urban areas are segregated. All the factors in the urban area have been marketized. We can sell our houses whenever we want in the city, especially in major cities, housing prices have been skyrocketing over the years. A house can sell for several million or even tens of millions of RMB. However, for farmers, they cannot sell their houses. No one would ever want to take their houses. Compared with other citizens, farmers do not have a source of property income. Therefore, we should develop a total factor market in the rural areas and promote free flow of the factors that can benefit farmers and ease the tensions between the urban and rural populations. Fourthly, we need to properly address the relationship between the virtual and real economy. An inflated virtual economy will do harm to the real economy. The 2008 financial crisis in the US resulted from the flooding of financial products. The Asian financial crisis in the 1990s also started from the overloaded debt. When the debt chain got ruptured, it triggered a total breakdown of the economy all across society. We have to take the lessons and exert a moderate control over the virtual economy so that it develops in line with the real economy at a rational pace. Lastly, we have to properly address the relationship between the government and the markets. There has to be a clear division of labor between the two. What's the role of government? First, market regulation. Second, macro control. Third, the supply of public goods. Fourth, coordination of the economic ties with other economies. Outside this range that covers the market, enterprises can make their independent decisions and markets can play a decisive role in resource allocation. From emerging powers to expanding partnerships, from fighting poverty to combating climate change, booming economies, war-ravaged nations, and everything in between, we capture the changes affecting the most dynamic and diverse continent on the planet, taking you beyond the headlines to the people and their stories. Asia Today, delivering Asia to the world. Wahaha is one of China's largest food and beverage corporations and one of China's largest private companies. We need to pay over 500 different types of miscellaneous fees. Its outspoken board chairman, Zong Qinghou, complained in 2015. Government officials responded that the number of miscellaneous fees the corporation has to pay was 212 items, as if there's nothing wrong with more than 200 different fees. This is not an isolated case of a business complaining of high costs. When asked why he planned to open a factory in the U.S., the head of Fuyao Glass, the world's leading supplier of automotive glass, responded that the reason was that it would be less expensive. He explained that manufacturing companies in China paid about 35 percent more in taxes than did their counterparts in the U.S., citing value-added tax as the biggest burden.
The issues that these entrepreneurs raise highlight some of the deep conflicts and tensions in China's economy. To analyze the success over time of supply-side structural reform in the five categories you talked about, what, what are the metrics that you would look to the, to, to indicate success? What are the, the key performance indicators uh, that you track uh, on each of those elements? Uh, of course, uh, direct indicators are very clear. Overcapacity issue has been how can I, modified or resolved to some extent. If you have uh, a good uh, measurements on the capacity, but taking into account, on the other hand, inventories in the housing sector, you, it's possible to have data, but of course, at the current, at the moment, the data is not uh, ideal, you know, but uh, it's measurable. In the terms of the third issue, deleveraging, I think, uh, first, it's necessary, you know. Second, the current, or oh, how can I say, conventional wisdom in measuring of the leverage maybe need to be modified. Number two, I think when we talk about leverage, actually you must define leverage on the basis of balance sheets. You know, you assume yeah, you know, your objective institution or government have uh, well-defined balance sheets, then you can define meaningfully, you know, and uh, uh, sort of leverage. Number four, actually it's relatively easy to define the overall cost for the firms, yeah. for corporate sector. We, we, of course, there are different measurements. Overall, how can I say formal tax as a ratio of the GDP? Uh, number two is the overall sort of the cost burden or burden, you know, uh, for the corporate sector as a matter of the ratio of the GDP, but incorporated other. In addition to the formal tax, but also Overall, you know, other a lot of revenues like the land sales revenues or a lot of fees collections, you know, and better government. Number three, actually, there's a lot of miscellaneous, you know, levies uh, imposed on the government. The final issue is the weak links of the uh, Chinese economy. I think the weak links can be addressed in two ways. One way is still better market mechanism. You have. Uh, more matured or, you know, and uh, effective market mechanism, you know, then there's a sort of the mechanism, you know, and uh, by which, you know, these kind of weaklings will be addressed, for example, in the, in the, in the uh, hospital, okay, like in the, how can I say, early caring sectors, you know, if you have uh, policy deregulation further, you know, you allow private firms or market to play a decisive role in that area, then you will see these kind of weak links will be addressed and more uh, quickly and more, how can I say, flexibly. Governments at different levels, provincial, municipal, and county level, all care about their economic performance and hope for higher growth rates in their place than in others. They take it as an important index for their political achievements. That is, officials believe higher economic growth rates speak of better political performance. However, I think such a mentality is problematic. If the government pays too much attention to economic growth rates, it may inevitably intervene in the market in terms of investment, resource allocation, etc., which cause negative effects in efficiency of resource allocation. In order to change the status quo, I think the first thing to do is to change the evaluation system in the government. That is, how we evaluate performance of a government or a major government official, say, a governor of a province or a city mayor. We should evaluate their performance not only based on economic growth rates in the region, but also upon development of their health care, education, and social security systems. Further, we should interview the public to see whether they are satisfied. All these factors should become important parameters in evaluation. Specifically, I want to emphasize satisfaction of the general public.
The concept of the market playing a decisive role and the role of the market versus the government has been a, um, a developing uh, challenge for China over two decades or more. Um, and so at the third plenum, we had the market playing a decisive role, the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress several years ago, and we're still talking about it. So what is it about the, the role of the market in China that seems to take such a long time to get right? Our understanding of the market's role has been developing over the 30 plus years since the reform and opening up. The market has been playing a more and more important role as the years go by. Originally, we advocated a planned economy with a supplementary role of the market in the early 80s. Later, we promoted a combination of a planned economy and a market economy. Then, during the third plenum of the 14th Party Congress in 1993, the idea of the market playing the fundamental role was first put forward as the report was drafted. Use of the coinage of fundamental role lasted from 1993 to the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress in 2013, for more than 20 years. In 2013, we first launched the concept of the market playing the decisive role of resource allocation. This change of wording from fundamental role to decisive role was a leapfrog development in understanding. When the market indeed plays a decisive role, society is following the rule of value. That is, goods will flow to where they can sell for high prices. Then enterprises that can take the highly priced goods must have great efficiency. Those that cannot afford the price cannot get the resources because they are not as competitive in terms of efficiency and management. And the less competitive should be eliminated. Are we ready? China, a nation with the largest population on Earth, assuming a greater role economically and politically on the world stage. Understanding China is critical for all, though difficult for some. Behind the scenes of China's transformation, I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn. Join me to get closer to China. Culture Express. See the world in color. This year, 2017, is the year of a CPC National Congress. It'll be the 19th, it'll be in the late fall, where the policies and leadership for the next five years or even longer are decided. So with that event later in the year, does that put additional pressure on economic planning in general? Does it put more pressure to have short-term results? <laughs> This could be the case. We call it the political effect. Every time we hold the plenary session, economic performance fares better that year than in other years. We refer to it as a tribute to the Congress. Governments may work harder to deliver better economic performance. Local officials also hope to get more recognition from society and their superiors through their good-looking transcripts. However, in recent years, the cadre management and human resource system has been developing. Economic achievements call for long-term efforts. Image projects with one year or even less time devoted to them cannot get official success. Fairly speaking, in the five years since President Xi took office, party cadres have already been evaluated. Their dedication and achievements over the years are put on the table and are clear to see. The single year's performance won't matter too much as the marks have been given. So even if short-term efforts do generate certain results, they won't greatly affect the general evaluation. 
很好的评价。You know the 19th Congress, National Congress of the CPC, you know, will give a, a new opportunity, you know, uh, for the top leaders and the China society as uh, at large, you know, to reflect what happened, you know, in recent years or define, mm. you know, the, the policy agenda or the task in future also. Very importantly, she has successfully strengthened the leadership, you know, and also defined by as a core leader, you know, that also indicates, you know, and uh, she firmly and uh, strengthened the, the leadership in the top leaders uh, group. So in other words, you know, in 19th Congress, uh, she and his team will have opportunity, you know, and to, how can I say, overhaul the situation in a more thoroughly way, and also initiate necessary policy agenda. And, uh, number two, I think, of course, it's external environment change, you know, very significant, very important, substantial, you know, both in Europe, especially in states, okay, so very important. But uh, come back to the structural reform, I think uh, structural reform is one of the most major reform agenda, you know, oh, how can I push forward, uh, put forward by Xi himself and his team. In my personal observation, the structural reform maybe can have the potential and to become sort of the policy issue which will be inherited by the new Congress, you know, and the new National Congress of CPC, linking the 18 Congress policy agenda and the coming, you know, 19 and the policy agenda. So in other words, it's a linkage, you know, between the two areas. If the RMB remains strong and our economy sustains a growth rate of around 7%, then, as I see it, China's per capita GDP can reach $12,500 by the year 2023. What does this figure indicate? It means China will overcome the middle income trap to join the League of High Income Countries. According to the World Bank standard, the threshold is a per capita GDP of $12,000. So if we succeed in the supply-side structural reforms, after seven years, with our per capita GDP reaching $12,500 in 2023, 1.3 billion of our population may join the League of High-Income Countries. This would be a milestone in human history, with so large a population enjoying such prosperity. 超過現在所有的高收入國家的人口的總和。Get used to supply-side structural reform. It is one of the most significant mid-course corrections that China has made to its economy since the beginning of reform almost 40 years ago, and we'll be hearing about it for years. Supply-side structural reform eschews short-term fixes, especially debt-driven stimulus and focuses on five long-term targets. Cutting industrial overcapacity, cutting housing inventory, cutting corporate debt and leverage, cutting corporate costs, and strengthening weak economic links. There are challenges expressed as a series of dialectical tensions between government and market, short-term and long-term, acquisitions and divestitures, urban and rural, and supply and demand. Perhaps the biggest challenge is how to implement supply-side structural reform and simultaneously maintain an acceptable GDP growth rate. Given China's political system, the biggest impediment is local government. Senior officials must come to realize that they will be evaluated, demoted as well as promoted, based on diverse criteria, primarily people's satisfaction, not primarily GDP. That's closer to China.